Okay, everybody, let's come back in and get ready and continue with the service. Everybody, if you're out in the lobby, come on in, find your seats. Sure. Okay, you know, I just want to say I, we are so blessed in our congregation. I, I'm so blessed. We have great people playing here in our worship team. I and mean, let's just, I want to show them appreciation. I throw songs at them sometimes that they've never even seen before, and they're playing them just so beautifully. And I mean, we are so blessed to have an incredible worship team in this church. Um, okay, Steve, do you want to, you're going to do the Shema and the If I could trouble you all to please rise. If you're visiting with us, you'll notice a little laminated sheet somewhere in the pew uh, back or on the pew in front of you. And you're going to need that because we're going to turn around and face the east as we chant the Shema and the Vehafta. We are facing Jerusalem right now. Please join me as we pray. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Baruch Shem, Kivod Malchuto, Le'olam Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be his name, whose glorious kingdom is forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Uvechol me yodecha ve'ahavta et Adonai Elohecha. Bechol nebacha, uvechol nafshecha, uvechol me yodecha. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Please be seated. Yamod Aharon ben Yochanan. Boruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Asher Bachar Binvim Tovim Viratsava Divrehem Hanemorin ba emet Boruchata Adonai Habocher ba Torah Uve Moshe Avdo Uve Yisrael Amo Ubin vie ha emet Vatsedek And in English Blessed is the Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who has chosen faithful prophets to speak words of truth. Blessed is the Lord for the revelation of Torah, for Moses his servant, and Israel his people, and for the prophets of truth and righteousness. This morning's Torah reading comes from the Psalms. Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills, where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who, has, he who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel with, will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and your going, both now and forever. (laughs) 
Al HaTorah, ve Al HaVodah, ve Al Hanvim, ve Ayom HaShabbat Hazer, Shana Tatalanu Adonai Eloheinu, Lik du shavit lim nucha, lichavod ulti foret. Alako Adonai Eloheinu, anachnu modim lach, um varchim otach, yit barach shimcha befi kochai, tamid leolam voed. Boruch Adonai, Mikadesh HaShabbat. For the Torah, for the privilege of worship, for the prophets, and for this Shabbat that you, O Lord our God, have given us for the holiness and rest, for honor and glory, we thank and bless you. May your name be blessed forever by every living being. Blessed is the Lord for the Shabbat and its holiness. Amen. Amen. Well, I don't know if you figured it out yet or not, especially if you're visiting with us, but we're not going to do a service like we normally do. I mean, it's Purim. And one of the key mitzvahs for Purim, one of the things you're supposed to do is read through the book of Esther. Well, I didn't want to quite go through the whole book, but what I decided we'd do is we'd read through a big chunk of it together. I've condensed it and summarized it, and we're going to do it back and forth. I'm going to read a piece, you're going to read a piece, I'm going to read a piece, you're going to read a piece. Now tonight at the Purim party, tell the story again, then we'll have the groggers and the name and all that uh, shouting, but during the reading of the scripture today together, we're not going to do that. Our, our point here is not to have fun but to learn, see what God has done, and possibly grow from it. Before we start in the reading, though, because I'm going to pick up actually in chapter 3, give you a little background. Our people were dispersed because of our sins. We were taken off to Babylon, where we were there for 70 years. God said, you may now go back. And some of us did go back, but a bunch of us got comfortable, and we stayed in Babylon. Now, the city might be called Babylon, but by this time, the Babylonian Empire has been replaced by the Medo-Persian Empire. And a king arose who's quite famous. His name is Xerxes, uh, Ahasuerus in another language. You've probably heard of him because of the whole Spartan battle with the 300 who held off the entire Persian army. Well, that king of the Persians in that battle was Xerxes, this guy. He had a party... And he wanted his wife, the queen, to come out and show off her beauty to everybody there. And she refused. So he called in all of his advisors and said, what do I do? And they said, you can't let her get away with that. Then all of us at home are going to have problems with our wives. They'll never listen to anything we say. Remove her from the, from the throne, divorce her, find yourself a new woman. So the king said, that's what I'm going to do. And he held a beauty contest, to put it simply. And all these eligible maidens from all over the empire came in. And he got to pick the ones he wanted. Ones. One of them, though, would become queen. There was a very beautiful young Jewish girl named Hadassah, or Esther. And her uncle Mordecai said, don't tell anybody you're Jewish. And guess what? She was selected, and she became the queen of Persia extremely influential position, to say the least. This was the dominant power in the whole, that whole part of the world. It was a huge empire, and she now becomes queen. So I pick up the story in Esther chapter 3. I'm going to read, and then your portion will come up on the screen when you need to read. Are you ready? All right. Here we go. By the way, while Mordecai was hanging outside of the palace, he overheard a plot to assassinate the king. And he sent to Esther and said, hey, I heard about this plot to assassinate the king. You better tell him. And they investigated and found out it was true. And they executed the guys who were plotting and scheming. And the king lived. And of course, this is all because of Mordecai. So King Ahasuerus, Xerxes, 
promoted a man named Haman, and he advanced him and set his throne above all the officials who were with him. The king ordered... And they all did so, except for Mordecai, who refused to do it. The other officials in the royal service asked him why he was disobeying the, com the king's command. Day after day, they urged him to give in, but he would not listen. To them, he would not listen to them. He said, I am a Jew, and I cannot bow to Haman. So... Well, Haman was furious when he realized that Mordecai was not going to kneel and bow down to him. And when he learned that Mordecai was a Jew, he decided to do more than punish Mordecai alone. He made plans to kill every Jew in the entire Persian Empire. In the twelfth year of King Xerxes' rule, in the first month, the month of Nisan, Haman ordered the lots to be cast, Purim they were called, to find out the right day and month to carry out his plot. The thirteenth day of the twelfth month, the month of Adar, was decided on. So Haman told the king, there's a certain race of people scattered all over your empire and found in every province. They observe customs that are not like those of any other people. Moreover, they do not obey the laws of the empire, so it's not in your best interest to tolerate them. Now, I'm reading with you, but if the words are up there, you, you, you can read too. I figured if I didn't read, it wouldn't pick up on the microphone, so I'm reading on your part as well. So the king gave Haman permission to annihilate the Jews. Please join me. When Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes in anguish, and he dressed in sackcloth, covered his head with ashes, and walked through the city, wailing loudly and bitterly, Throughout all the provinces, wherever the king's proclamation was made known, there was loud mourning among the Jews. They fasted, wept, and wailed, and most of them put on sackcloth and lay in ashes. Can you imagine what they were thinking? Imagine if you got the decree. Tomorrow, news says, I don't know, if you own a yellow shirt, you're going to be executed next month. What would you do? You'd probably say, that's not right. That's not fair. And then you start freaking out. Well, what can we do? Where's God? Why is he going to let this happen? They're just terror-stricken, grief-stricken, and mournful. So Mordecai asked his niece, or cousin, depending on how you translate it, to do something. Join me. And and Esther gave this message to Mordecai. If anyone, man or woman, goes to the inner courtyard and sees the king without being summoned, that person must die. You want me to go see the king? He hasn't called for me. If I go there, I'm going to be executed. That's the law. Everyone from the king's advisors to the people in the provinces knows that. There's only one way to get around this law. If the king holds out his gold scepter to someone, then that person's life is spared. But it's been a month since the king has sent for me. And he said, don't imagine that you're safer than any other Jew just because you're in the royal palace. If you keep quiet at a time like this, help will come from another place for the Jews, and they will be saved. But you will die, and your father's family will come to an end. Yet who knows? Maybe it was for a time like this that you were made queen. Esther sent Mordecai this reply. Go, get all the Jews in Susa together. Hold a fast and pray for me. Don't eat or drink anything for three days and nights. My servant women and I will be doing the same. And after that, I will go to the king, even though it's against the law. And if I must die for doing it, I'll die. It's the right thing to do. When the king saw the queen standing outside, she won his favor, and he held out his royal scepter. What is it, Queen Esther? The king asked. Tell me what you want, 
and you'll have it, even if it's half my empire. So Esther replied, if it please your majesty, I'd like you and Haman to be my guests tonight at a banquet I'm preparing for you. The king then ordered Haman to come quickly so that they could be Esther's guests. So the king and Haman went to Esther's banquet. And over the wine, the king asked her, tell me what you want, you shall have it. I will grant you your request. Your request. So Hes, uh, Esther replied, if your majesty is kind enough to grant my request, I would like you and Haman to be my guests tomorrow at another banquet that I will prepare for you. And at that time, I'll tell you what I want. When Haman left the banquet, he was happy and in a good mood. But when he saw Mordecai at the entrance of the palace, and when Mordecai did not rise or show any sign of respect as he passed, Haman was furious with him. But he controlled himself. He went on home. Then he invited his friends to his house and asked his wife to join them. And he boasted. He boasted to them about how rich he was, how many sons he had, how the king had promoted him to high office, and how much more important he was than any of the other king's officials. What is more, Haman went on, Queen Esther gave a banquet for no one but the king and I, and we are invited back tomorrow. But none of this means anything to me as long as I see that Jew Mordecai sitting at the entrance of the palace. So his wife and all his friends suggested, why don't you have a gallows built 75 feet tall? Tomorrow morning you can ask the king to have Mordecai hanged on it and then you can go to the banquet happy. <laughs> Haman thought this was a good idea so he had the gallows built. That night, before Haman went to the king, the king couldn't sleep. So he ordered that the chronicles be read to him of his kingdom. Basically, the minutes of the government. And he heard again about Mordecai saving his life. He remembered that this guy saved his life, Mordecai. Now remember, he doesn't know anything about what's going on with Haman. He just, all of a sudden, coincidentally, remembers that Mordecai saved his life. And the king asked... How have we honored and rewarded Mordecai for this? And his servants answered, Nothing's been done for him. Are any of my officials in the palace? The king asked. Now Haman had just entered the courtyard. He had come to ask the king to have Mordecai hanged on the gallows that was now ready. So the servants answered, Haman's here. He's waiting to see you. Show him in, said the king. So Haman came in. Remember, Haman's coming in to ask for Mordecai to be executed. The king's asking for an advisor on how to honor Mordecai. So Haman came in, and the king said to him, There's someone I wish very much to honor. What would I do for this man? Haman thought to himself, Who could the king want to honor more than me? It's got to be me. So he's thinking what he would want the king to do for him. So he answered the king. Have royal robes brought for this man, robes that you yourself wear. Have a royal ornament put on your own horse. Then have one of your highest noblemen dress the man in these robes and lead him mounted on your horse through the city square. Have the noblemen announce as they go, see how the king rewards someone he wishes to honor. Then the king said to Haman, hurry and get the robes and the horse, and provide these honors for Mordecai the Jew. <laughs> Haman has to do this to Mordecai. So Haman got the robes and the horse, and he put the robes on Mordecai. Mordecai got on the horse, and Haman led him through the city square, announcing to the people as they went. Now, can you imagine Haman's face when the king said, I want you to do this for Mordecai the Jew? He couldn't put on it I'm unhappy face in front of the king. That wasn't permitted. So it had to be something like this. <laughs> now he's got to dress the man he despises in royal attire. 
and lead the horse that Mordecai is sitting on throughout all the capital city, saying, this is how the king honors the man he deserves to honor, or chooses to honor. Throughout, everybody is seeing Haman do this. <laughs> so Haman got the robes and the horse. He put the robes on Mordecai. Mordecai got on the horse. Haman led him through the city square, announcing to the people as he went, see how the king rewards a man he wishes to honor. Mordecai then went back to the palace entrance while Haman hurried home, covering his face in embarrassment. And Haman told his wife and all his friends everything that had happened to him. And while they were yet talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried to bring Haman to the feast that Esther had prepared. Can this day get any worse? <laughs> and so the king and Haman went to eat with Esther for the second time. And over the wine, the king asked her again, Now, Queen Esther, what do you want? Tell me. You shall have it. I'll give, even give you half the empire. Queen Esther answers, If it please your majesty... Now remember, he's at a feast with his beautiful wife. He just had one the day before. He's drinking wine. He's the king of the greatest empire on the planet. Life is good. There's probably music playing in the background. He's undoubtedly reclining, sipping wine with his right-hand man, Haman, his beautiful wife. Life does not get any better than this. He is fat and happy. It's a good day. Now, honey... I'll give you whatever you want, even half my empire. What is it you want, Snookums? <laughs> if it please your majesty to grant my humble request, probably formal language, he's heard it a hundred times, my wish is that I might live and that my people might live. Maybe she bursts out in tears now, falling down at his feet. My people and I have been sold for slaughter. If it were for nothing more serious than being sold into slavery, I would have kept quiet. I wouldn't have bothered you about it. But we're about to be destroyed, exterminated. Then King Xerxes asked Queen Esther, Who dares do such a thing? Where is this man? Could you, uh, wouldn't you have loved to see Haman at this moment? Oh man, white as a ghost, trying to crawl under a rock. He had no idea Esther was Jewish. Now he does. Esther answered, Our enemy, our pers persecutor, is this evil man, Haman. Haman faced the king and queen with terror. The king got up in a fury, left the room, and went outside to the palace gardens. He needed a moment to think, to compose himself, what does he do? I mean, think about it. The man he just made chief vizier of the entire empire ordered the execution of his wife. Now, the laws of the Medes and the Persians cannot be changed. A king cannot even repeal his own law. This law is set in stone. It can't be repealed. Now, he's got his wife he's got to save. He's got his vizier that he wants to strangle. He's in a quandary. He doesn't know what to do. And he's really, really mad. And I'm thinking, the last person you want to anger is the king of Persia. So he goes outside the, to the palace gardens to compose himself and to think. In the meantime, Haman's in fear of his life. Haman could see that the king was determined to punish him for this, so he stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. He had just thrown himself down on Esther's couch to beg for mercy when the king came back in. Now he's on the couch with his wife. <laughs> this story is amazing. <laughs> Seeing this, the king cries out, Is this man going to rape the queen right here in front of me in my own palace? Then one of them said, Haman even went so far as to build gallows at his house so that he could hang Mordecai, who saved your life. And it's 75 feet tall. Hang Haman on it, the king commanded. So Haman was hanged on the gallows they had built for Mordecai. This story is just awesome. They ought to make a movie out of it.
I know they did, but not a good one. They should make a good movie out of it. So the king not only spared Mordecai, but he promoted him to Haman's place. And now he's chief vizier. But we still have a problem. There's an extermination date set for the Jewish people, which includes Mordecai and Esther. You can't repeal the law. What do you do? Mordecai left the palace wearing royal robes. Oh, by the way, he, they came up with a suggestion. If we can't repeal the law, how about we make another law? And this law will say that we're allowed to defend ourselves on the day of our execution. Now, this was a huge political situation. One law says kill all the Jews you want and seize their property. You can take their stuff. The other law said the Jews could defend themselves. So we know there's a political imbalance in the empire right now. It looks like initially the king was against the Jews, but now he's for the Jews. So if you want to be on the king's side, you better stand with the Jews. But if you want to be a little sneaky and you have a legal excuse to try to steal somebody's property, you could get away with doing it if you wanted to. I love this country. Mordecai left the palace wearing royal robes of blue and white, a cloak of fine, pure linen, and a magnificent gold crown. Then the streets of Susa rang with cheers and joyful shouts. For the Jews, there was joy and relief, happiness and a sense of victory. In every city and province, wherever the king's proclamation was read, the Jews held a joyful holiday with feasting and happiness. In fact, many other people became Jews because they were afraid of them now. This is why Jews observe the 14th day of the month of Adar as a joyous holiday, a time for feasting and giving gifts of food to one another. That's why we're having a party tonight. This happened all that time ago, and we're still celebrating. You better be there tonight. Verse 20. Mordecai had these events written down. Maybe he wrote the book of Esther. Mordecai had these events written down and sent letters to all the Jews throughout the Persian Empire, telling them to observe the 14th and 15th days of Adar as holidays every year. They were told to observe these days with feasts and parties, giving gifts of food to one another and to the poor. So the Jews followed Mordecai's instructions, and the celebration became an annual custom. Little more data. The Jewish people were fine, but we got to kill a whole bunch of anti-Semites that day. It was so good that we did it again the next day, killed a whole bunch more. And so not only did we survive, but a bunch of evil people were executed or killed in the battle. Good times. <laughs> <laughs> the book of Esther is a very interesting book. To date, it's the only book in the Bible that has not been found amongst the Dead Sea Scrolls. Some people think that's intentional, that they didn't think it was part of the Bible because God is not mentioned in the book the only book of the Bible where God's never mentioned. It's funny, I probably read the book 50 times before I heard that trivia and said, of course he is, and went back and read the book and said, what do you know? He's not. Because it's so obvious that he's there. And it reminds me of a, a lot of stuff going on today. You know, we don't see God, we don't hear God, but it's obvious he's there. There's a lot of speculation. Why, in this one book of the Bible, is God not mentioned? Now, it's all speculation. I have no idea. I speculate this year something different from next year. But let me tell you what crossed my mind this year. Remember I told you the Jewish people were permitted to go back to Israel. Why didn't we? I'm thinking the people who stayed behind, for the most part, were very apathetic about God. They probably didn't much think about God on a daily basis, didn't really care about God. I could be wrong. But they certainly weren't honoring God by returning to Israel. And I just wonder if God's not mentioned in the book because the people really weren't 
mentioning God. And it was kind of like God was quiet, like he is now, working behind the scenes while most people weren't honoring him, kind of like now. I don't know, but it's something interesting to think about. I know this, though. This I know for sure. Whether or not Israel forgets God, God never forgets Israel. And I mean the Jewish people who are sometimes in the land called Israel and sometimes not. God said this to Israel in Jeremiah 31. I have loved you with an everlasting love. There is nobody on the planet who understands love like God does. We have some amazing relationships. that God, God gives us love. It, it's his creation. And he lets a husband love a wife and a wife loves a husband. And it's a beautiful thing. But sometimes we don't really love our spouses. And sometimes we just say, I'm done with you, and we divorce them. And so even though we understand love to some extent, we've got this thing called divorce. God doesn't divorce people he loves. He never divorces Israel. And so we sort of understand a parent loves a child, but sometimes children get kicked out of the family because of their behavior. And so we know love to some extent. But listen to what God said. The Lord has forsaken... Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Well, I guess it has happened. It, it's a rare thing, but it does happen. Though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. God is saying that his love for Israel is even more than a mother nursing her child's love, which is the biggest love we can comprehend on this planet. But he loves us more. Those are words on paper. I don't understand it. I would like to. I theoretically understand it. But from experience, we don't know love like that. Unless you meditate on some of the things God has done for you. And then you're just amazed. We even sing a song every few weeks. I'm amazed by you. But I want to look at that choice of words God used. I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. That's a very interesting choice of words. In fact, I wanted to look up the Hebrew word for engraved. Chokek. And I looked it up, and it means to cut out, decree, inscribe, portray, or govern. Seems like a broad use of the word for something that means to carve into your hand. How can you get govern out of that? And then I wanted to see how it was used in the Bible. And the very first place it's used in the Bible is in a Messianic prophecy. In fact, it's used in the second Messianic prophecy in the entire Bible. This is the prophecy. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the people. Now, a messianic prophecy is a prophecy about the coming Messiah. The first couple in the Bible are very vague. This is also vague. It's hard to understand. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. So this is a prophecy that Judah would someday rule, because they hadn't yet. This was written before even Judah became a nation or a tribe. And they would, they would re remain the leading nation even up until the time, the, the leading tribe even up until the time of the Messiah. They would be the kingly tribe. The word in this prophecy, the Hebrew word hokeik for inscribed, like he said, I inscribed you on the palms of my hand, is the word lawgiver. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a hokeik, a lawgiver, from between his feet. Now, how is it that the word lawgiver means inscribe? Well, it's not that hard to figure out. They're the ones who wrote down the law. And what did they write on in those days? Clay tablets. They inscribed. They carved it in. Sometimes laws were even written on stone. Ten Commandments. So a lawgiver is a an engraver, a scriber. Clay tablets, stone, 
And sometimes laws were even carved into flesh. Circumcision. The piercing of the ear of an indentured servant for life. But he says, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. So it's not too far a stretch to think of the concept that the law of God is that he would never forget Israel. It's more than just love. It's a law. It cannot be broken. Stronger than the law of the Medes and the Persians. God is incapable of stopping his love for Israel. He said, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. But remember, the first use of that word is in a messianic prophecy. The word to engrave in the hands is first used in a prophecy about the Messiah. That is very interesting in light of what we know about Yeshua, Jesus. And very interesting in light of another messianic prophecy. This is what King David wrote. When the Messiah comes, this is what he said. He's speaking in the first person as if he were the Messiah. Psalm twenty-two, sixteen: A band of evil men has encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. So it's as if the messianic prophecy is saying that when the Messiah comes, his hands and feet will be pierced. Now that's a weird descriptive way of abusing somebody. What kind of abuse produces the piercing of hands and feet? In those days, there was none. But then the Romans came along and they invented this thing called crucifixion where they would pierce the hands and feet of people. By the way, that psalm that says they pierced my hands and my feet starts with these words. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from the words of my groaning. When Yeshua, Jesus, was being crucified, he said those exact same words. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which immediately would have brought everybody's mind to the 22nd Psalm. And there he is up on the cross with his hands and feet pierced. He died for our sins. He dies. He resurrects. And some of the disciples saw him. And they're telling some of the other disciples, hey, we saw Yeshua. He's actually alive again. Yeah, right. Come on. People don't raise from the dead. You think I'm gullible? There's one guy famous for his doubt. Thomas. We have a phrase to this day, doubting Thomas. Thomas said, unless I can see the wounds right there in his hands and where he was pierced in the side, if I don't see those, I won't believe it. So Yeshua shows up where he's having dinner and says, hi, Thomas. I understand you have some doubts. Look, it's me. And he falls down at his feet and says, my Lord and my God. He doubted no more. You know, it's not just Israel that God loves. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. God's love for us is certain. But here's what's uncertain. Our love for God. And the salvation relationship with God has to be a two-way street. He cannot save you just by loving you. You've got to love him back. You've got to choose to believe in him and to follow him and to trust his son with your soul because he died for your sins. All I can do is tell you the story, but whether you internalize it and make it your own or not, that's between you and God. And I would encourage you, above all things, to give your life to Yeshua to thank him for dying for your sins and to firm up your relationship with God. If you've not yet done that and would like to do that this morning, our prayer room will be open right after services. And there's somebody in there who'd love to lead you in prayer. Just tell them, I want to follow Yeshua. Pray with me, and I'll be happy to do so. Or you can pray yourself. Just tell God you believe and you want to follow and ask him to forgive you, and he will. Please join me in prayer.
Lord God, thank you for Purim. Thank you for saving us yet again. And we're going to call on you again in the future because evil men are out there who want to destroy your people. And I pray, Lord, between now and then, many would come to trust Yeshua and have their souls saved and to love the God of Israel. You have done so much for us. Your love is an everlasting love. You've even engraved your love on the palms of your hands. And we thank you so much. And we thank you for Yeshua. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me?
Well, I'd like to uh, dismiss you with ironic benediction. Please bow your heads. Yevarecha Karonai V'yishmarecha Ya'er Adonai Panavalecha V'ikunecha Yis Adonai Panavalecha V'yosem Lecha Shalom And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Chag Sameach, happy holiday. Shabbat Shalom, I'll see you tonight at 6.30.